Well, good morning, everyone. I want to start this morning by telling a little story. Uh, when uh, it was a couple of years ago, I got involved in something called an urban warrior dash. Now, if you don't know what an urban warrior dash is, it's a five-mile run. It happens all over the United States, and they set them up in different cities. Uh, and it's not just a five-mile race; it's also kind of an obstacle course. So uh, I found myself in this, and if you know anything about me, you're probably at this point asking, "Well, you know, it sounds interesting, Andrew, but why were you involved in that?" Because if you do know anything about me, you know that I despise physical exercise of any kind. Uh, my uh, idea of a great weekend is sitting on the couch, watching a movie, and stealing the candy that my wife bought for my two-year-old. So uh, this was not my uh, idea of something fun, but nevertheless, I found myself in it. Uh, and I have to admit, to the start of it sounded uh, kind of exciting. We got started. I was running with a whole bunch of other people, and uh, we hit our first obstacle. It's an old car that's been kind of reassembled as an obstacle, and you've got to climb over it. You've got to go under it. It was a little humiliating when the seven and eight-year-olds were diving over it like Olympic athletes, and I was dragging my lifeless body underneath. <laughs> But nevertheless, I made it through, and I kept going. I thought, okay, this is interesting. I wish I could tell you that it was like mile three that I hit the wall and couldn't keep going. It was like 15 seconds in, uh, but I, uh, I kept going at this thing. And with every mile that I hit, with every obstacle that I hit, it got a little bit more hard. I got a little bit more out of breath. Uh, I got a little bit closer to the heart attack that was building inside of my chest. Uh, and things weren't looking good for me. I started to hate this very quickly, and I'm watching people overtake me go this thing. Uh, but there was one reason in specific I found myself in that race, and I actually made it to the end of the race as well. I got all the way to the end, past numerous different obstacles. I had to run up and down the steps in Soldier Field, uh, but I made it to the end. And there was one specific reason, as I say, why I was in the race and why I was able to make it to the end. And I'm not going to tell you just yet. I want you guys to hang on, and we're going to come back to that story. But I, I tell that story not just because there's something else I want to get at, but also because it's not unlike the topic that Paul is going to be talking to Timothy about in our passage today. If you were with us a, a few weeks ago when I last had the opportunity to speak, uh, you'll remember that we went through the letter of Second Timothy, chapter one, and in that letter we are looking at Paul in the final days or final months of his life. Uh, he is in a prison. Uh, on his way towards execution, he references in the letter that he knows his life is going to be poured out very soon. And so what he does is he writes this letter to his good friend Timothy. Timothy is a very, very close friend of Paul's, who is a church leader in the city of Ephesus, which is where we get the letter of Ephesians. And Timothy is uh, listening to what Paul has to say about his final pearls of wisdom, because Paul, knowing that he's not going to be around much longer, wants to leave Timothy with some good advice on what it means to be a church leader. And what we talked about last time I was here is the fact that Paul challenged Timothy to preach the gospel. He said that you've been called by grace to preach this gospel, this message of who Jesus is and what He's done. It is your mission, not only as a church leader but as a Christian, to tell people about this message. And in chapter two, in the continuance of this letter, we're going to see that Paul goes a little bit further than that. He goes a little bit deeper into what it means to be called by grace, and in fact, he talks about sharing grace with others. So, if you guys have a Bible this morning, would you look at Second Timothy chapter two with me? This is what Paul says to Timothy in the first few verses. He says, "You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules." It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So, as I say, Paul began this letter, this letter of Second Timothy, to his dear friend by telling him, "By grace, you have been called to preach the gospel." 
And now he's going to take that a little bit further. And what he's going to say is, Timothy, not only are you called to preach the gospel, but you are called to pass on the gospel. What he says is in verse 1 and 2 that I want you to take this gospel and I want you to entrust it to faithful men who will be able to likewise pass it on again. So Paul is challenging Timothy to to be a leader, Timothy, to be a church leader and to be a Christian ultimately. You have got to pass this message on. Now I stand in front of you today as a Christian, someone uh, who's involved in a church and who believes in what Jesus has done for my life because of someone who came and met me when I was 16 years old in England. At the time, I'd grown up in a church where I had absolutely no interest in Jesus or in the message of Christianity. Uh, I'd always gone there because it was the thing that you were supposed to do, that was the right thing to do. But I never prayed, I never read a Bible, I had no interest in it for myself. And that all changed when I met someone uh, who was coming on a mission trip from the United States to my hometown to work with youth in the area. And I built up a friendship with him, and what was different about this guy is not only did he seem excited about what the message of Christianity was. Not only was he young and interested in what this was, but he invited me to be a part of something called discipleship. Now, if you haven't grown up in a church or you haven't grown up around a Bible, discipleship might be a word that's a little strange for you. And it it was for me when I first heard that word. Uh, What I asked him was, are you in a cult? Because discipleship to me sounded so strange. It, It It sounded like he was trying to get me to come and kind of buy in as a follower of uh, some strange uh, God or some strange leader, religious guy. But what I found out was that discipleship is far more simple than that. It's not as ugly as it can sound if you haven't had experience with it. Discipleship is actually something very, very simple and straightforward, and it's fundamental to what it means to be a Christian. I would argue that not only am I here because of discipleship, but everyone in this room is here because in some way you have been discipled by someone. You are in a church and you know what the gospel is or you have heard about the gospel because someone decided to come and invest in you and do exactly what Paul is challenging Timothy to do, which is entrust the gospel to someone else. Now, there's two things that are implied by what Paul is telling Timothy that I think we all need to to think about. The first is that if Timothy is going to do what Paul is challenging him to do, then he's going to have to build relationships with people. And then the second thing it implies is that he's going to have to invest his life in people. Now the reason those two things are implied by this is that if Timothy is going to entrust the gospel to someone, he's going to have to get to know them. Because if he doesn't build a relationship with someone, how could he possibly know if it's someone that he can entrust something to? You see, what Paul is saying is, I want you to, do, to trust this to someone. So that means it's not just about telling them what the idea is. It's not just about explaining or arguing with them. It's about passing on the heart of what the gospel is about. They have to be able to be trustworthy with it. And the only way you can know that is to get to know with someone, to build a relationship with them. Now it implies investment as well, because even if you find that person who you're going to entrust the gospel to, if they are going to pass it on, then they're going to need to be trained to do so. See, that's what Paul had done for Timothy. He'd met Timothy, built a relationship with him, and then he trained him in the gospel. He trained him in what it means to be a disciple maker. He trained him in what it means to lead in the church. That's what this letter is in its essence, is a training letter to Timothy. And so those two things are right at the heart of discipleship, building relationships and then investing in people's lives. And we really shouldn't be surprised about that because what those two things are is what the gospel is anyway. See, the gospel is the message that God in heaven came down to live with us Philippians tells us that God took on the form of a servant, that he put on flesh and became a baby. And then he grew up with us, living uh, what we guess from historical records is about 30 to 33 years. And so he lived multiple decades with people. He grew up with us. He lived his life with us. He did the same things that we did. When he met his disciples and he called them to follow him, he spent his life with them and he invited them to spend their lives with him. They laughed together. They ate their meals together. They traveled the country together. They probably told jokes to each other. Everything that we would do in our lives, Jesus lived that with his disciples. So we know that the God of the Bible, the God who is at the heart of the gospel, is a God who likes to live life on life. He's not just a God about an idea and a philosophy who comes to, to tell us that we need to buy into something. He's a God who comes to live with us. So then it shouldn't be any surprise that those who follow Jesus should do likewise. And that's what Paul is challenging Timothy to do, to live his life on life with others. 
Now that's not the only thing that he's challenging him to do. And there's something else that he says in verse 1 and 2 that's really uh, should stand out to us. And what Paul says is you need to be strengthened by the grace that's in Jesus. You need to be strengthened. Now why would he need to be strengthened? Why does he need strength from Jesus in order to be able to do this? Well, because discipleship is very, very hard to do. To be a disciple maker, to be someone who's going to build relationships and invest your life in other people, that is sometimes going to include suffering. And that's exactly what he says in verse 3. He says, share in suffering for the sake of the gospel. Share in suffering is a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. See, making disciples calls us to endure for the gospel. It calls us to think about how we are spending our lives, how we are building our relationships, how we are pouring ourselves out for the sake of someone other than ourselves. And Paul warns us that there's going to be suffering involved in that. Now, there's a story that I think of when I think of this idea. It's a story of an Iranian athlete called Zara Namati. Zara Namati was a martial artist. She was in the sport of Taekwondo. She was a black belt, and she was very, very good at what she did. And she was actually headed towards the Olympics. But unfortunately, in 2003, she got in a car accident and she lost the use of her legs because of a spinal injury. She was paralyzed from the waist down. So in an instant, everything that she hoped for that she was working towards was taken away from her. Now, Zara didn't stop there. She didn't give up because of a challenge. What she decided to do is she was going to take up another sport from scratch. She went from being an Olympic-level athlete to an amateur, and she took up archery. And with only six, within only six months of starting to take up archery, she was ranked one of the best in Iran. Not only that, but she won multiple championships alongside able-bodied athletes, people who didn't have any kind of disability. She qualified for the 2012 Olympics and won several medals. And then she qualified again for the 2016 Olympics and won medals there. So this story is about someone who persevered, someone who was so dedicated and committed to their sport that they advanced even in the face of difficulty and suffering. And that is not unlike one of the analogies that Paul gives. Paul gives three analogies to Timothy about what it means to endure for the gospel. He talks about a soldier, he talks about an athlete, and he talks about a farmer. I want to look at those really quickly together and try and gleam a little bit of what Paul might be communicating to Timothy here. So when we think about a soldier, what Paul says is that no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So he says soldiers don't get involved or entangled in civilian pursuits. They aim to please the one who enlisted them. So let me ask you guys this morning as we think about making disciples, as we think about what it means to follow Jesus, what entangles you? What distracts you? What gets you away from what God has called you to do? What is it in your life that prevents you from starting on this journey of making disciples? And not only that, but a soldier's aim is not just simply to avoid civilian entanglements. It's also to win a victory, to fight, to battle against resistance. So where in your life, when you face resistance, are you battling for the gospel? Are you bringing the gospel to bear on the struggles in your life? Or better yet, is there anyone in your life that you are fighting for? Do you fight for the people around you for the sake of the gospel? Do you pray for the people in your family? Do you tell them about Jesus? Do you pray for the person who sits in the pew next to you every Sunday? I have to admit that I don't always do those things. I know that I should, but I don't. I don't find myself avoiding those entanglements. I don't find myself fighting the way that I should. And that's where grace is going to meet me. The second analogy that he gives is of an athlete. He says that an athlete isn't crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Perhaps another way to think about that is that an athlete is not going to win the race if he tries to take a shortcut, if he tries to cheat the track that he's running. So again, let me ask you guys this morning, as we think about what it means to endure for the gospel, where are you trying to shortcut God's call on your life? Where are you trying to avoid those things that God has, by his grace, called you to do for the sake of the gospel? 
Where are you avoiding the things that you know deep in your soul you need to be doing? And here's what I want you to take away from this one as well is this isn't just about making it to heaven because none of these analogies that Paul is talking about are certainly here when he's talking about an athlete. The victory that he's talking about is not that you're just going to make it to heaven. That's not what he's saying. We go to heaven, we have a relationship with Jesus based solely by grace alone through faith alone. It's all about Jesus. But what it is saying that we should take note of is there is reward and there is victory beyond that. There is something that God desires for us to experience, to know, beyond just simply being saved. And if we try and shortcut the life of following Jesus, if we try and shortcut the life of being a disciple and being a disciple maker, then we will miss out on that reward. We will not be crowned because we will not compete according to the rules. So I challenge you guys to think about those shortcuts in your life because there is no reward if you jump ahead and God wants to reward you. The last one he gives is of a farmer. He says it's a hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. He's essentially saying that no farmer has ever reaped a harvest unless he's gone out and poured hours and hours of work into sowing seeds, in watering, in pruning. So where are you guys pouring your life out? Where are you putting in work? Where are you finding the places in your sphere of influence where you can go and serve, where you can go and love, where you can go and extend grace to people? Because there is no harvest unless we do that. One of the things that Jesus said to his disciples is that the harvest is plentiful, but the work is a few. Jesus has already told us and let us know that there is a harvest to be gleaned if we go out and get it. There's just not enough workers. So let me challenge us as a church, and this includes myself this morning, are we going to be those workers? Are we going to go into those fields that are ready to be harvested, and are we going to put the work in so that we can share in the first crops? Because again, that's the little hidden meaning there, is that God is trying to give us hints. There is something to be got out of this. This is not a thankless calling. This is not a rewardless calling. There is something to be gleaned. Now, coincidentally, if there is anybody who is looking to invest their life and, and make disciples, then I would love for you to come and make disciples in the middle school ministry. Now, I don't just say that simply because I work with middle school and I love students. I say it because I am proof that discipleship makes a difference in the life of students. I would not be here if someone hadn't decided to come and pass the gospel on to me and endure through all the disappointing conversations and difficult trials that we went through together as we lived our lives together. I wouldn't be here. I absolutely believe that 100%. And so when you guys get involved with the different ministries in this church, when you get involved with your neighbors, when you get involved with your co-workers and you encourage them and you build them up and you pass the gospel on to them, when you seek to make disciples in your life, you are making an eternal difference. One day there might be someone out there who is serving, who is preaching the gospel, who is going off to far off nations, and you might be the foundation that they stand on. They might be standing on the fact that you chose to disciple them, that you chose to build a relationship with them. Someone out there might make a difference because you chose to make a difference in their life. And that can't be underestimated. So I challenge you guys, just as Paul challenges Timothy, think about the areas where you are getting entangled. Think about the areas where you are trying to take shortcuts. Think about the areas where you are not going out to harvest those fields. And ask God for grace. Because it's okay to be in a place where you know you're not doing those things or you feel like you haven't done those things the way that you should. Even this week as I prepared this sermon, I was painfully aware of the different ways in which I am not doing these things. I'm getting entangled in things that are distracting me away from what God's called me to. I'm taking shortcuts when I could be involving my life with other people. And I don't because I get frightened about it or I get fearful that it's going to be too difficult that I might not have the right words to say, I might not have all the wisdom that I need to have. But you see, when we find ourselves in that place, in that place of need, then we are remembering what this whole series is all about, uncomfortable grace. The reason why Jeff told us on week one that grace is something that we barely understand but desperately need is that as Christians, we regularly find ourselves in need of a God who can help us. And that is the best place to find yourself because it's in that place that you will meet the hero of the gospel. 
See, that's the key to making it through. That's the key to passing the gospel on and enduring for the gospel is the hero of the gospel. If you're sports fans, you probably know Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy is the former coach of the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, And after, after he retired, he continued to try and find places in his life and in his profession where he could invest in people and coach people. And one such person was a man named Michael Vick. Michael Vick was a pro football player who got involved in illegal dogfighting and ended up going to prison as a result. And Michael Vick, by all accounts, was a very unpleasant person. He didn't get good press. People didn't like him. Yet Tony Dungy looked at Michael Vick as an opportunity to go and invest his life in someone, to go and love on someone and coach someone. And so that's exactly what Tony Dungy did. He went and he built a friendship with Michael Vick. He encouraged him, and he helped him to turn his life around. Now, if you were to ask Tony Dungy why he did that, I guarantee you he would say because of Jesus. Because Tony Dungy is an evangelical Christian, and he said many, many times in interviews and in books that he does what he does because of what Jesus has done for him. He values coaching people and he values serving people because he knows that he has already been served by someone else, that he's been loved and rescued by someone else. And that's where uncomfortable grace meets us. Realizing that we have been loved by someone else apart from our deservedness of that. And that's what Paul says in the end of this passage as he keeps going to Timothy. He says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. The offspring of David has preached in my gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Now I want to pause there just briefly. We need to remember that the guy writing this letter who's talking about enduring and suffering is not someone who's outside of that. What he's just said is that he is bound with chains. He's writing this letter in a prison cell knowing that he is on his way to execution and there is no avoiding it. And not only that, we learn in the Bible that Paul was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was rejected, he was arrested multiple times, and now he's in a prison cell, away from all the people who he loves, away from doing the thing that he loves to do, knowing that he's heading towards his death. But somehow, Paul finds joy. And as an extra little tidbit, I do want to let you know that Paul was not an impressive man. We learn in the letter of 2 Corinthians that Paul was actually... Not an impressive person to look at. In the letter of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about different things that they have been saying about them. And one of the things that they've been saying is that Paul has really great letters. He writes some really impressive stuff, but when you look at him, there is nothing to be impressed at. They actually say that he has a, a weak appearance. Now the reason I say that is that when we think about Paul, when we think about the things that he suffered, we need to remember that there is nothing about Paul that should have helped him make it through those things. By all accounts, he was not an impressive person to look at, yet he endured shipwrecks and beatings and imprisonments. How did he do that? We should care about the answer to that question because that is the answer is how we can endure for the gospel and how we can pass the gospel on just like Paul did. And Paul tells us the answer. He says that though he is bound with chains as a criminal, the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with glory. He says, I endure everything because I want people to know this same Jesus that I have found. This Jesus that I have found has turned my life upside down, Timothy, and I have no greater joy than when I see other people meet him the same way that I did. See, the joy of making disciples is that you get to see people meet Jesus. You get to see people encounter a Savior who's rescued them, who loves them, who redeems them, who will stand with them in the midst of everything they do. That's the joy of discipleship, is you get to be with Jesus. You get to be with Jesus where he loves to be most often with other people. Paul also said in the letter to the church in Philippi, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul is saying that everything in his life compared to Jesus is rubbish to him. It's trash. It's not even worth thinking about because of how precious Jesus is. Is that the Jesus that you guys know this morning? Is that the Jesus who you came into this church to worship 
A Jesus that is more precious than everything else in your entire life. So much so that when you look on the things around you, that they're comparable to rubbish. If you don't know him, then let me encourage you this morning, that doesn't change the fact that that's still who he is. And that Jesus, who is more precious than silver and gold, is the same Jesus that wants you to know him like that. As you sit here, as you listen to his word, God wants you to know the Jesus that makes everything else seem like rubbish. A Jesus that is more magnificent and beautiful than anything else. One of the verses in the Bible that changed my life and actually got me involved in ministry is a verse in Philemon 1.6, which is another letter written by Paul. And in Philemon 1.6, this is what Paul says. He says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may be effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. That completely changed my life because up until that point, I thought discipleship and sharing the gospel and serving people was about getting something done so that Jesus would be happy with me. Actually, almost the opposite is true. When you go and make disciples, when you invest your life in other people, when you love other people, then you will meet Jesus anew. Paul is saying, I pray that when you share your faith, that you will know Jesus better. When you get involved in this, when you give your life, when you pour it out for other people, you will meet Jesus like you have never met him before. And that's another reason why you should love this and get excited about this. That's actually the reason why we as a church love neighboring and love making disciples because at the heart of that, it's about helping other people come to know Jesus. And it's about us as a church knowing Jesus better ourselves. We say every week that we want to meet people where they are, that we want to extend grace to them, that we want to help them grow in faith. Because when we do that, we see them meet the Jesus who is more precious than gold and silver. And we ourselves are reminded of the hero of the gospel and meet him anew. See, here's where I want to land this morning. As we think about making disciples, as we think about what it means to pass the gospel on and endure for the gospel and to remember the hero of the gospel, we need to remember that grace ultimately is uncomfortable because it calls us In fact, it demands of us that we respond to it, that we go out and make disciples, that we go on and pass the gospel on. But if we are willing to listen, if we are willing to see it, then uncomfortable grace also does something else. It calls us to remember the hero of the gospel. It calls us to remember the God who came to live his life with us, the God who came to build a relationship with us, the God who came to give day after day after day, conversation after conversation, so that we could know him better. I told you at the start of this sermon that there was a specific reason why I did the Urban Warrior Dash. And some of you that know me well will have already guessed what it is. It's because my wife loves to go on runs like that. Janine loves to be an athlete. She loves to get involved in marathons. And so she had conned me into doing this terrible race. But you know what? When I did that, I found myself enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. And it wasn't because it wasn't difficult. It wasn't because it wasn't painful. It wasn't that it was almost going to kill me. It was because I got to be with someone that I loved. I got to be with her as she did what she loves the most. And as a result of seeing her love it so much, I started to love it. And now I look back on that time in my life and that race and no matter how difficult it was I look back and I smile about it I enjoyed it no matter how difficult it was no matter how much I had to endure it and make it through that race I loved it because I got to be right next to the person I loved church discipleship will put you right next to the savior that you love if you want to see Jesus if you want to meet Jesus if you want to know who the Jesus of the Bible is then go and invest in building relationships and loving and serving people Go out into your neighborhood. Be the chapel on your street because that's where Jesus is. So again, let's end this morning by not just being reminded of the call of grace to go and make disciples and to pass the gospel on, but let's be reminded of what grace does in our own hearts. That it makes us look towards a God who served us and loved us. Go and give your life for other people because God has already given his life for you. Would you guys pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for your great love. Thank you for your great, amazing grace. Thank you for your uncomfortable grace that calls us to make disciples, that calls us us to pass on the gospel, 
to endure throughout difficult things so that others can know you and so that we can know you better, Lord. What a gift that is that you would call us to something and actually put inside of it a reward for us, Lord. All that does is speak to your generosity that you don't just demand things of us, but even as we serve and go out for your gospel and for your glory, even there you meet us, even there you bless us. And God, I pray for this church as a whole, Lord, that you would bless us as we go out and seek to make disciples. Father, would you put the grace of the gospel, that uncomfortable grace, deep in our hearts so that we would find the joy of knowing you and making you known. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we close.